Roy, thank you for coming on the show. Just for editing's sake, let's start it now. And we were talking about Zoom call, so let's go back into what you were saying. Yeah, so I think what I think what's really interesting about it is that uh, first of all, I think it was a grotesque failure of the imagination of the business world not to experiment with video calling and other forms of remote working uh, more energetically than they did. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that companies should have uh, wholesale adopted, uh, you know, across the board, five days a week remote working, because I don't think that'll be the future. I don't think that'll be the future even in five or ten years' time. I think there's a huge role for um, physical co-location some of the time. Yeah. But the failure even to experiment, I think, was a grotesque I mean, it revealed a kind of extraordinary element. I've always had the suspicion that businesses don't actually think about many things. They get, you know, occupied by fads, habits, traditions, or generally sort of conformist yeah. behavior. But the failure to say this is patently a significant technology, we should at the very least engage in a few uh, measured uh, experiments. And I did, in, in my defense, in that what I discovered was very interesting was that when you said, because I've always been a fan, and I said to my sort of 15 or 16 staff in the behavioral science practice, what I noticed is when I said, by the way, you're free to work from home. I don't mind you working flexibly. No one did. Yeah. And I suddenly realized when you say that, people see it as a concession and they feel their kind of burning reputational capital every time they take advantage of the privilege. Right. And Margaret is, no, 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 you, you're not understanding me. This isn't a privilege. It's not a concession. I actively want you to work this way. And it was only when I said, right, okay, Friday, everybody who, who you know, can work from home, we'll have a nice little Zoom meeting to begin the day where we all catch up. Then we'll get on with either writing what we need to write in solitude or meeting virtually. And right. it was only when I kind of mandated it that, I, that people adopted it in any kind of numbers. One, and you realize what a strong force presenteeism is. One, one thing that you've written a lot about is signaling and signaling value. And it yeah. seems like we're just losing these signals by the day. Like we had in-person college, that might be off the table. The beautiful office space, the fancy company in-person course, the London Black Cab, the Super Bowl ads, the engagement rings are on the decline. So in the context of remote work, like what signals do we have left? If you're a career-minded person and you want to show that you're on the rise without necessarily having to create results, what, what, do you, what, like, what signals do you have in the Zoom world? Uh, there's a huge opportunity for people like Nikon, okay, or for example, Sony, to create really high-end prestige video calling equipment with a little bit of not-so-subtle branding in the left-hand corner of the screen or oh, the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, um, which could be a business status symbol every bit as much as a flash car or a parking space was in the physical world. So there's a huge opportunity, I think, for someone, because my great quibble was that the way um, video calling was sold, it was sold as the poor man's British Airways, not the rich man's British Telecom. And it was a kind of low status mode of communication. Right. And I think there was also the fact, of course, that if you think about it um, very cynically, I strongly suspect that if most companies' T&E expenditure was mostly incurred by junior staff rather than senior staff, there would have been pressure to um, uh, work remotely and to adopt video conferencing much, much sooner. But it tended to be the most senior people in the business who were boarding a flight uh, or sitting on a first-class seat in the cellar or whatever it might have been. And of course, you know, to some extent, it's not realist. It, it's, I, I mean, it's not ridiculous that business travel confers status. And the fact that someone's willing to pay, in the case of a transatlantic flight, £3,000 for your presence somewhere isn't actually a bad proxy indicator of someone's value. Um, but I think um, you're right about this. That I mean, by the way, I think offices, you might argue, offices become more about signalling now right. they don't and need to be for, quite so big. Especially when you're talking about Silicon Valley and these really hip, cool companies that are the ones that are going to have the resources to do mass testing and all that stuff. Yeah, no, so, I mean, the other thing that's interesting is I think, obviously, the current equilibrium isn't right either. Even kind of extreme advocates like me never proposed that this should become a five days a week thing. Um, for the most part. I mean, obviously, you know, there are people who, for whatever reason, need to live a long way from London, and we should reconsider, you know, how we work with those people. Um, but 
I would argue uh, to a strong extent that the, certainly whatever the right equilibrium is between working remotely and working face to face, uh, what you might say is 95 to 5 is not the ratio. Right, um, right. And, that makes sense. And to take a step back a little bit, you know, you, you've written that you have to allow people a small space to try things that don't make sense, especially in the ad business. So I'd just love to hear, you know, what does that space look like at Ogilvy, especially now in digital context? How have you gone about building that? Well, I think, I think if you go back on it, the, the, the distinction is what narrative you apply to free market capitalism in part. And the standard and dominant narrative up to now has been it's an efficiency thing. So if you look at the assumptions of mainstream economics, the assumptions of mainstream economics actually pollute popular thought to a surprising extent. So, for example, the assumption is that people know what they want. Uh, they know exactly how much utility they're going to derive from buying it. They trust the person who's selling it. Um, and therefore, the only thing you can do to improve the lot of your customers is either to produce the same thing at a lower cost or to produce something new. And that's what you might call a complete psychology free model of the world where perception, framing, comparison doesn't have any impact on how we value something or what price we're prepared to pay for it. And it also tends to assume, by the way, it assumes a kind of panglossianism, which is whatever business people do is probably optimal. So it completely denies the fact that actually, although we mostly talk about biases in consumer behavior, business to business decision making, institutional decision making is in fact riddled with biases. In many cases, the bias is being far more extreme than those you find among individual consumers. And my argument is that the, the efficiency narrative and the cost cutting narrative of business is too dominant. And I would argue that a large part of the uh, value of free market capitalism and comp competition lies in variety. That actually, there are huge numbers of things we don't know. And there are huge numbers of things about ourselves that we don't know or can't describe. And in many ways, the only way you really find out what people want is by offering it to them. And so the examples I give, and I can give about nine examples of extraordinarily successful billion dollar businesses, which if you imagine rewinding 15 years and presenting the business idea to a perfectly rational group of people, say investors, nearly everybody would say the idea was downright stupid. And a very large part of business success isn't planned. It isn't thought through in advance. It is, if you like, perhaps bullshit that happens to get lucky yeah. or it's ignorance that gets lucky or it's uh, so strangely one of the reasons mm -hmm. entrepreneurs can seem peculiarly stupid in some respects is because of course in the wider scheme of things stupidity can be an advantage because you're not yeah. constrained by the assumptions of everybody else in the category and, and the, the examples i give they, yeah the areas where they don't look stupid are the areas that are so well trodden as, as to be completely mature markets are competitive and filled up and hard to make profits. So, no, exactly. I mean, yeah. Zoom is a wonderful example of that, what yeah. we're actually using at the moment. Because when Zoom first went to investors, the standard investor response was, I don't understand why you're going into this space. It's already baked. You're up yeah. against Microsoft, Facebook. Uh, um, you're up against Google. Uh, you're up against Apple. You're up against Amazon, who've bought Twitch. Why on earth would you try and compete against free products by giant organizations by offering for offering a freemium product um, you know are you completely insane and Dyson would be another example if you come to me and you know, I'm someone with a disproportionately high appetite for counterintuitive or seemingly nonsensical ideas yeah. but I would have told James Dyson to piss off I mean if he came in and said look I think there's a market for the $800 vacuum cleaner and the $400 um, hair dryer okay I would have said look yeah. James mate you know you know, marketing guy here, I'm sympathetic. I like, I like the thinking, okay? But first of all, everything we know about vacuum cleaner purchases suggests that the expense is somewhere between naught, where you catch one from your parents, and about $250, $300 at max, okay? There is no market 
for the $800 vacuum cleaner um, that we can visibly see. On top of that, by the way, um, let's be honest, anybody who can afford 800 bucks for a vacuum sure. cleaner probably yeah. doesn't clean their own home. So they're not well, even going to be doing their own home. But I, I'm, just, I'm just curious because it seems like the writers like yourself, the, the great minds that I end up flocking to, uh, it seems like we're always kind of dancing around the scene to love in a lot of ways. And I'm just wondering if you feel the same way. Like there's this idea of this middle of the barbell. And I, I have this in my life with a guitar, right? Like I either want the cheap guitar that I don't have to worry about or the $5,000 guitar that's amazing that I love to play and looks cool and all, all that stuff. Do, do you think that, that that's a good way to describe this? The Dyson by, uh, you know, vacuums on one end of the barbell, you want the cheap one or the other? And the that's, that's my assumption. So first story. of all, you're absolutely right that if I'd looked at the, and the same goes with an espresso, by the way, which is if I'd looked at the Gaussian curve of what people spend on a cup of coffee at home, what you would have seen before Nespresso came along um, and effectively reframed the whole thing, you would have seen a tiny number of people who bought, um, you know, unroasted Jamaican Blue Mountain, roasted it at home, and then made it, made it themselves in some peculiar kind of uh, steampunk device. And those people were spending 40, 50 pence on a cup of coffee consumed at home. But they would have been an unbelievably tiny niche. And yet you're absolutely right. And yet actually there are many things which I think are a barbell. I mean, it was always, I think my grandmother's advice with umbrellas, which is, she, my, my grandmother was, a, was a, an umbrella barbell enthusiast, avant la lettre, yeah. if I may say so, so. Uh, which was that you either buy a cheap umbrella because you don't care if you lose it, or you buy a fantastically expensive umbrella, which you're heavily conscious of and which you don't forget. Well, yeah, exactly. And I think much more dramatically, where I've heard this observed being played out now, especially in the States, is in, is in colleges, right? So in the context of a digital college experience, Harvard's going to be okay. The public university at whatever, seven grand a year or, is going to be okay. But the but middle's going to be hollowed out. Can you imagine like, commuting into Pepperdine, which is this beautiful LA campus? Like, what, Why would you telecommute into a school like that? So now all these people that are like, I'm not going to get to take my kid to college. I'm not going to go to football games. Maybe I'm not going to spend that 50K a year and put my kids to school there. Are, are you seeing that in, in your neck of the woods? Yeah, so, so with the barbell, with, for example, the vacuum cleaner, the, the argument I would give is that your vacuum cleaner breaks or you decide you need a new vacuum cleaner. And you might argue that I occasionally use the phrase, you don't get an endorphin rush from mid-market retail. OK. And my argument is I, I, I discovered this weird phenomenon walking into a shop with my wife to buy bedding. And I said to her, look, um, can I can, can I make a deal with you here? Can we spend one of two amounts of money, nothing or a lot? And my argument was if we spent a middling amount of money, we'd end up with a bed which was similar to our previous bed, but slightly newer. In which case, I'd spent two or three hundred bucks on sheets, but I hadn't actually got a thrill out of it. I'd merely got a kind of maintenance feeling. Right. Was it so? If I spent nothing, that was great because I could go and buy a drone instead. And if I spent eight hundred bucks, I could get excited by Oxford pillowcases and mattress toppers and tog values and thread counts, and I could actually turn it into a bit of a nerdy experience. And you know, I think Elon Musk has been ingenious there. If you look at the attention paid by Tesla, not just to the battery stuff, but to fart mode, dog mode, okay? Elon has an instinctive or indeed uh, acquired understanding of Carnot theory. And Carnot theory is the idea that all products have differing attributes. You have basic attributes that fulfill the function. In other words, the absence of those attributes renders the product useless. And that would be a milk carton that doesn't leak. But a non-leaking milk carton doesn't really create any delight. And uh, I, those are called kind of, uh, they're kind of threshold attributes. Then you have performance attributes, which is how good is it at the thing it's supposed to do. And that might include things like range, battery life, etc. But then there are these weird things called delight attributes, which are weirdly peripheral to the main function of the product itself, but which disproportionately and supralinearly create excitement in the customer. And I think, um, you know, I think we've got to praise old uh, Elon, uh, not only for his extraordinary work into batteries, rockets and spaceships. I mean, you may not like the guy. I'm not sure I like the guy. Um, uh, but... Uh, you've also got to praise him for, for fart mode, dog mode, and Joe mode. The right, fact that, 
you know, there, there are tiny little features. Right? Elon is the best salesman you've ever met. So, you know, I think a lot of the times Elon is selling without you realizing. Well, of course, that's also true of Steve Jobs. I mean, the more techie people within Apple were slight, we always forget this, but they were slightly resentful. I mean, the famous quote is, I don't get what Steve even does, like he can't even code. Okay. And so there were people at Apple who saw Jobs as, uh, you know, essentially a kind of impresario, which of course he was. Um, but the fact was that um, Jobs had customer instincts which were inordinately better. It, I mean, if you go back just to the simple aesthetics of what appears on screen, uh, you know, or usability, all the tech guys were asking, what can this device do? Okay. And Jobs was asking a much more important question, which is, what does it feel like while you're doing it? And as a result, he was able to innovate in very interesting ways because he was able to break the rules of a category by changing the metrics. And that's a very simple <coughs> summary. You can, uh, if you change the metrics, you change the rules. If you change the rules, you've just created a new innovation space. And his would have been, I was with a bunch of people from Nokia on the day that the first iPhone came out. And in amongst the, you know, the non-concealed non admiration for the uh, usability and elegance of the device, there was also ridicule, which is it doesn't even have 24 hours battery life. Okay, now it was assumed to be basically a sine qua non that your phone would still be alive by the time you got home, even if you'd been clubbing, as young people call it. Okay, and the Nokia people were slightly laughing about that. And of course, the thing was that people loved using it so much, they found their own solutions to that problem, which is to buy a charging case or to carry a charger into work and plug it in during the day. And so in, in terms of universities, I think there's a different for, form of innovation going on, which is the form of innovation where you unbundle something. Okay, now, if you look at holidays, the way the British used to buy holidays was you bought a bundle and it was a hotel, it was a fortnight in Alicante, and you got the flight, you, you paid for one thing and you got everything. And the way low-cost airlines changed the game there is they said, well, actually, you can book the flights and the hotels and the car hire all independently. And the interesting thing, if you look at a university, is it's actually about four business in one. It's an information transmission business where generally the tools used haven't changed since the Middle Ages. Okay, so I, even when I was in university in the 1980s, I kind of remember thinking going to lectures, like, we have invented the VHS video, okay? Why the hell do I have to travel across this miserable Finland town uh, in order to go and listen to a man talking when, to be honest, he could have recorded the whole thing with illustrative photographs and we all could have just watched it in the comfort of our own rooms or with a group of mates, you know, whatever. Okay, we, we could have consumed that information in our own style. And likewise, the university didn't really acknowledge that the photocopier existed. You know, you weren't handed many photocopied things back in 88. And so there's partly this information transmission business, which, to be honest, can be revolutionized by technology. Then there's this, but the thing is about that is the information, my brother's an academic, academics aren't very well paid, okay? So the information transmission business doesn't receive all that much money. What gets the money is the real estate business, the hospitality and accommodation business. Every time my university or my college writes to me, they're always trying to buy some sodding building. But I go, but this is stupid, right? Okay. Yeah, to be honest, I will be like more likely. Time with that when you have it, when, when they're, they're always wanting to build a fucking building, business. right? Right. And they're like real estate empires, these things. And I go, to be honest, guys, I'd be more likely to give you money if you said, um, we've got this really cool professor of Egyptology, but he's going to leave for Yale unless you buy him a Dodge Viper. To be honest, I'd be so, more so likely to give money to that. To, to jump off <laughs> into, you, you've written a lot about how about you know the idea of an over an over premium put on efficiency and how there's sort of an overvaluation of things that you can measure. But what I love about alchemy and why it's you know one of my favorite books on, on marketing and so on is that it's rich with examples of falsifiable experiments that you've done to to test irrational ideas. You know, using this direct response approach. So, you know, my question is, how important do you think that skill of measurement and attribution is to being able to actually execute and launch these irrational ideas, irrational solutions? Well, if we unbundle the university, and there's actually a book uh, about this, which is called something like The Unbundling of the 
college, what you might call the educational industrial complex. If you're being really odd about this, I could have achieved many, 80% or 70% of the social value I derived from going to university probably didn't take three years. So there's a Pareto question going on there, which is, should you have one year? Should the University of Oxford, which is part luxury goods business, okay? It's part basically the educational wing of Bista Village, which is a luxury outlet mall about 10 miles away. It's part real estate empire and it's part information transmission. Now, what you could have now, obviously, they're terrified of losing their scarcity value because it would create all forms of disruption. Secondly, the elite educational brands are incredibly robust because what you're choosing when you choose a university is you're not choosing your own opinion. You're choosing the peer group opinion. You're actually going what universities are considered prestigious by other people because those are the ones I want right. to go to. And as a result, you can change your mind at an individual level, changing collective opinion, barring some massive Oxford scandal involving, you know, an enormous paedophile ring or something. OK, the reputation of that place is pretty much going to be the same in 2070 as it is in as it was in 1740. Okay, so they're incredibly difficult to, um, as, as brands to unseat reputationally unless you really significantly disrupt. Now, what I would do if I were in charge of Oxford is say, why isn't everybody resident for just one year? We make the thing three times. Maybe they're resident again for another, you know, five weeks when they come back. We make the thing cheaper. We make the university bigger. And we separate out the social um, and the informational components. In a, in, a, in a using technology to do so, okay? But don't you think the opposite could also happen where if you lose all the middle tier universities and everything in the middle, then you have the Harvards to just control the whole game they are kind of like these walled palaces even more than they are now. They can just sort of dictate their own terms. Well, you, I mean, the only thing is, I suppose, um, if you unbundle it, um, the other behavior becomes acceptable because it's seen as an alternative to Harvard rather than a poor substitute for Harvard. And this mental framing is really important. You know, if you go to a second or third tier university, generally, there are obviously exceptions in that you get universities which have an extraordinary specialism around sport or music or drama, or occasionally you get universities which have an amazing sort of maths reputation. I mean, just to give an example, the university, of, it's a pretty prestigious university to begin with, but the University of Leeds and the University of the West of England are very good if you're studying transportation. I think it's Waterloo in Canada for computing, if I'm right. Is that right? Which is kind of the Harvard, you know, in other words, if you're, if right. basically I mean, what yeah. you want to do is yeah. go into Silicon Valley, going to the University of Waterloo in Canada is not seen as, well, why wouldn't you have gone to Harvard? It's seen as an alternative. Okay. So once the high, the, what you might call the unbundled education becomes seen as an alternative to the establishment, not a substitute, a poor substitute for it, then the choice architecture does change because you can position what you did as a choice, not a compromise. Sure. And part of that unbundling, so you have the information component and you have the, the educational component. So if the educational component gets, gets unbundled and you don't sort of have this coming of age experience. Are there, are there any other ways you see that playing out where young people can get that sort of hero's journey like thing? <laughs> without uh, there's having one, to college? There is one very mischievous way in which young people have already gamed the system. Uh, which is to apply to Harvard, get a letter of admission, immediately get on a plane, not to Boston, but to San Jose, and hawk their letter around the tech firm saying, I've been led into Harvard, but to be honest, I'd rather work from you, for you. And what they've discovered is the admission letters of Harvard is worth maybe 80% as much as the degree from Harvard, but it doesn't cost them a quarter of a million dollars to acquire it. It's actually sent to them for free. So that's an extraordinarily clever way where someone's hacked the signaling value of admission and realized that I don't need to be $250,000 in debt before I start work. And uh, so um, you, that's an example of unbundling it. I have to say that's bloody ingenious as well. I mean, presumably as well, if you pitch up in front of Musk or Peter Thiel uh, or people who are slight university skeptics, um, that that approach really plays well to them as well. 
And yeah, yeah. so, I mean, if you think about it, TED is a kind of university for the middle aged, isn't it? So the admission criteria are quite strict. So actually, the, the, the extraordinary thing of TED is it's an unbundled university because anybody can watch the stuff. Then there are three levels at which you can attend it. You can pay, well, you can, I suppose you can get admitted as a speaker. Um, you can pay the full 7,000 bucks or whatever it is, which also requires, you know, some degree of, you know, criteria of admission. And you can be there for five days hanging out and networking. Okay. Or there's a cheaper alternative, which used to involve going somewhere like Palm Springs, I think, and watching the whole thing remotely and live, which also had a degree of sociability to it and co-location, but at a lower cost. Or you can watch it live at home, or as many companies do, they broadcast TED live to their employees. Or you can watch it asynchronously. And so the same content is effectively rather like an oil refinery. Is, and, and cinema, of course, does the same thing. You can go and watch the premiere, um, you know, the, the full theatrical premiere. You can go to the cinema and watch it. Uh, you can wait a bit longer and you can pay Amazon for it. Uh, or, or have it out on Blu-ray. I'm, I'm never quite sure of the full order. It probably goes something like theatrical release, Blu-ray release, pay television release, uh, purchase, pay television release, rental. Uh, then it goes into pay TV, uh, in other words, subscription TV. Then it goes free to air. Right. And so at, at each level, they extract value from the original content. Um, and it's a trade-off between size of audience and willingness to pay, if you like. And they've effectively worked out a way where you make money out of this content. Now, in the same way, you know, uh, the professor of um, Egyptology at, the, at Harvard could sell lectures in a similar way. And Harvard could similarly say, do you want, you know, MBA programs, after all, do a hell of a lot of this, don't they? Okay. So if you look at MBA programs, there's the full-time three-year MBA, which is the flagship product. Many universities have said to me, many business schools have said to me, to be absolutely honest, we don't want to offer this bloody flagship three-year residential MBA, but it's the thing on which we're ranked in terms of the best business schools in the world. Okay, so we have to have this flagship product. The vast majority of people are not consuming the product in that way. Yeah. And, uh, and one of the things we've got to overcome, by the way, and this, this applies to things like the live broadcast of opera to cinemas as well. One of the things we've got to overcome is this idea that if you make something available in a cheaper form, you're cannibalizing your more expensive product. And yes, to a degree that, bear in mind, in the US, if I'm right, you couldn't show the World Series or the Super Bowl on TV within 500 miles of the match being played. Is that right? I'm not sure if that's right anymore. Um, no, 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 it certainly isn't true, it certainly isn't true anymore, because they've learned. But, but yeah, I, mean, I think that you, was true for a time. When you, when you think about it, it's kind of crazy. I mean, the idea that people go, would you like to go to the Super Bowl? I've got tickets. Nah, watch it on telly. You either want to go or you want to watch it on TV. Yeah, it's like okay. it's apples to elephants. It, 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 yeah. It's a completely different thing. It's, it, that's like right. saying, yes, to a degree, the McDonald's drive through lane cannibalizes the restaurant. But to a much greater degree, I think the McDonald's uh, drive through lane finds a completely secondary audience well, for the rest. I, I think where this comes into our world is, is courses versus books, you know, because people will make the argument, you hear this a lot, that, oh, it's the same information that you get in the book versus a course. But it's a completely different experience. It's all in one place. Uh, yep. the, the, there's just a, there's a lot more that goes into making it for one, but also like, it goes into the, the perception and the way that you remember things and this idea that, you know, if it was all about information, we'd all be millionaires with great apps. <laughs> There's something more going on there. I, I, maybe if you, if you wouldn't mind talking about that, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the course book comparison for my own selfish reasons, since that's what we're selling. Uh, there, there are also, it's worth remembering, there are also elements to the remote consumption of information. Uh, which are better than face-to-face. -face. Now, nobody even factors these in. I was not a diligent student, I think it's fair to say. Part of the reason I wasn't a particularly diligent student was I was, I was and am a massive night owl, okay? And um, uh, so lectures tended to be in the morning and they started at nine o'clock. Um, and my father was self-employed, so he only got up at about 10. So as a family, by habit, by temperament, by genetics, I'm just a late guy, you know, okay? 
And so I occasionally find myself missing lectures in the morning. And then at one o'clock in the morning, when there was only one TV station at the time in the UK, I was actually watching perfectly happily a 40 minute documentary on the Melbourne tram network. Okay. <laughs> and I was, and I was watching this, I was watching this with three students. Okay. Well, I, I think two of them were fellow classicists and one was a mathematician. And while, I, while we were sitting there watching it at one o'clock in the morning, we were not stoned. We were smoking. We were probably had a little bit to drink. <laughs> I suddenly said to the students, I said, my fellow students, I said, you know what's really hysterical about this, okay? If I told you this morning that at 6 p.m. this evening there was a lecture at the Sidgwick site on the Melbourne tram network, you all would have laughed your heads off and thought the very idea of attending this thing is fundamentally ridiculous. But because it's actually placed in front of you at the right time of day when you've got nothing else to do, it's now become suddenly absolutely fast. And I can still remember loads of details about that. Bear in mind, this was 1987, okay? And yeah. I can still remember, it's actually a cable car network, if I'm right. Is that right? Where the trams latch on to uh, moving cables. I'm fairly sure that's right. Sure. Yeah. Um, I will go and, I'll go and check how accurate my memory is. There may be some false memory syndrome going on there. But um, yeah. uh, the ability, we've just been talking about this with a guy from the Adam Smith Institute called Matthew Lesh. And we're talking about just work, which is there's free time versus work, okay? There's the hours you spend working and the hours you spend not working, okay? That's one trade-off between you and your employer. But there's also free when and free where. And yeah. one way, the, I argue, there's huge potential for a win-win, which is greater worker productivity combined with greater worker happiness. It doesn't involve financial exchange for hours at all. It involves the, the concession or recognition that people like to work at different times and in different places. And the, the open plan office, which I think is a terrible attempt to save for the, it, it's a terrible attempt to solve for the average because the open plan office is not barbell, is it? Right. Okay. No. Barbell is a university it's where you either work in your room or in a library. Busy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a terrible, it's a terrible environment for all sorts of things. The volume of electronic communication in an office goes up when you make it an open plan office. Okay. Right. So people talk to each other less and email more. That's one of the, you know, terrible um, consequences of it. And so, you know, I think it's worth remembering that along, we shouldn't frame uh, digital communication face to face as a poor substitute to real physical things. We should actually argue that it has strengths and weaknesses and there are trade-offs, but in many respects, not least you get much less siloed meetings. You get meetings with a slightly less rigid agenda. You get far more international contribution. You know, I've had chats yeah. since this lockdown started with Ogilvy Tbilisi and um, people in Ogilvy in Kenya. You know, I've had conversations with people who, you know, I never would have conversed with in the age of jet yeah. travel. And we've had were. the same thing by getting our clients meetings with Google and HP and, you know, Lenovo over the past two weeks. They're probably one of them happened under normal circumstances just because it's, <laughs> it's, there's more, I don't know what it is. It's, there's more perceived time. Uh, there's just the amount of disruption that's making people open to these meetings that might not have normally been. So. And, and there's another thing which appeals to me, which is I've been doing this gig in one shape or another as a copywriter, as a creative director, as a behavioral science practitioner, but I've been doing this gig for 30 years. Okay. Now, in some ways, I think I get worse at my job as I get older a little bit. But the one thing I notice is I'm a lot faster at knowing what to reject and what to pursue. And so having older, more experienced people in meetings, even if for only 20 minutes, has a value because their thinking processes complement those of younger people. I'm not saying I'm better or worse. I'm saying it's different. Okay. Um, Can and, you, uh, sorry to cut you off, but I'm curious about that. Um, how have you seen the flow of talent into the ad world change in your years? You know, is it, it seems like now a lot of the best and the brightest are going to Silicon Valley or to lesser extent law or finance. Do you think you know, the ad business has always been just the, the, the weirdos on the fringe? Or, or, uh, yeah, how have you seen that flow change? It, it varies a bit from one country to another. I think in, um, in America, it was historically seen as the arty end of the business world, whereas in Britain, it was seen as the greedy wing of the arts world. So the, the British advertising, I can't remember who it was who said that, but it's a very astute observation. Um, uh, first of all, I think the talent question is interesting because in fairness, we've always been able to make use of talent that our competitors can't. 
by having a different culture and a different approach to work and so forth. So it isn't just a question of, you know, do Silicon Valley firms outpay us? We do offer, you know, first of all, uh, you know, wider conceptions of how people can be valuable. It's a very broad, any good ad agency is an extraordinary mix of complementary talents in that way. I would say that the behavioral science um, uh, reframing of marketing, which is looking at marketing as a as the application of psychology to business problems, rather than the rather narrow definition of marketing that's been allowed to, um, uh, which we've all conformed to over recent years. That I think broadens the range of talent, um, particularly graduate talent. And we don't only need graduate talent, by the way. There are all kinds of valuable attributes that people have that contribute to a business. And you know, the people I need most are the people who are good at things I'm shit at. You know, those are the people who are really valuable, you know, to me. And believe me, believe you me, I'm shit at lots of things, okay? You know, and so the fact that actually you need complementary skills that work together, um, uh, you know, anything to do with timing, for example, I'm basically chronologically dyslexic. If you said to me the 7th of June, that wouldn't mean anything to me. You know, you might as well just make a white noise, <laughs> noise when you say 17th of June. It doesn't actually register with me at all. So... Interesting things there, which are that, that I think it enables us to hire more broadly because there are a lot of people who've done psychology at university or behavioral science or evolutionary psychology or um, uh, indeed, you know, um, all manner of kind of uh, humanities disciplines who can deploy what they've learned for us. Uh, once you change the marketing vocabulary to the one that academia uses rather than the one that marketer, marketeers use. And so that's, I think, important in terms of the breadth of talent we can attract and hold on to. Um, and I and think here, like here in the States, there seems to be like a really big geographic component to agencies, right? So you have lots of agencies. Big ones are going to be New York, LA, SF, whatever. And they're going to attract a very similar type of young person, millennial, generally you know, liberally minded. So in my, in my experience, you, you get sort of, uh, you know, you get, you get sort of a monolithic or, or siloed perspective on things. So I'm wondering how that compares to what, what you guys have. Yeah, I think, I think the, the very fact, regardless of political, liberal, educated bias, um, and, of, and the fact that it's a bubble, by the way. Okay, so even people who aren't particularly that way inclined find it much, much easier to pretend to be. Um, uh, it is a problem. Uh, in the words of uh, uh, Jeffrey Miller, uh, who wrote Spent and the Mating Mind, he says yep. that uh, Madison Avenue doesn't understand Main Street very well. Yep. And so, you know, uh, uh, put it this way, okay, it's not, a, it's not an environment where it would be safe below the rank of creative director to listen to country music very loudly on those headphones you've got, yeah, and, okay? What I find interesting is I just interviewed uh, a marketing leader at a CPG company, Nestle Waters, and she, and she said precisely, she's like, we're starving for agencies that get middle America because that's who we're marketing to for consumer packaged goods all day, and we can't find, we can't really find these people. <laughs> can't find people to understand. No, 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 no absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. by the way, I, I occasionally, the reason um, I will occasionally mutter right-wing sentiments is... A, because I am to the political right, I think, of most people in London advertising, but not, not dramatically so, just a bit. But I also do it as a kind of method acting uh, necessity, which is we need to continually remind ourselves that the way we think of the world is not necessarily typical. So the example I'd give of that bias would be you could produce the best ad in the world for the National Rifle Association, and it wouldn't pick up shit at awards shows, okay? Uh, whereas, you know, if you produced a mildly cute anti-gun commercial, uh, it would pick up lots of things. Now, the point about that is not that we should be doing pro-gun commercials, but we should be capable of doing so because, you know, the you whole point is... commercial to make, too. <laughs> But 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 I, I I just feel slightly uncomfortable. I agree with the fact that yeah. of course they're overwhelmingly clustered in metropolitan areas. They over, overwhelmingly um, tend to employ humanities graduates from particular universities, um, and the the simple. I mean, I, I during the time of Brexit, 
uh, in the UK. I was kind of disgusted by the ad industry. Now, I voted Remain, by the way, just to be clear about this. I didn't vote Remain with a huge sense of enthusiasm. I understood reasons why people would vote Leave and respected some of them, okay? And I didn't, by the way, I didn't think this was a clear-cut black and white decision by any means. There, you know, there are enormous faults to the European Union apart from anything else. The fact that it believes what it does is inevitable and it's incapable of self-correction is a fundamental institutional problem, okay? And, you know, there are, there are elements to it which are insanely undemocratic. I also, by the way, think that um, I'm generally pro-immigration but I think countries should have the right to say, yes, you can come and live here. Very small tokenistic thing. I think they should say yes to quite a lot of people, but I don't think you should have people in other countries who simply have a right to live in yours. Yeah. And it, okay? and it seems because like it changes, it changes like the whole nature of the exchange. People, yeah. And I, and I feel like a lot, of, a lot of what happens now is getting trapped into these false binaries. It doesn't make any sense. And so the two extremes, the false dichotomy around immigration yeah. is stupid, okay? It's just dumb. Because, you know, you can be a great host, but you still reserve the rights to deny people entry to your house, okay? And even if you don't exercise it very often, I don't think that's a right you can hand away. I just, uh, similarly, if you think about Europe, okay, uh, you can't really have freedom of movement if you don't have a common immigration policy. Because you couldn't have California deciding who could cross the border but with those people all free to move to New York or Chicago if they wanted to. Because then the needs of California for immigration, for example, the needs of Germany for immigration, because it's got a very elderly population, would mean that they would let in lots of people of whom the majority might move to Paris or London or Stockholm. Right. And so on a simple level of what works and what doesn't, that doesn't work. It's an idealistic, symbolic gesture um, performed by intellectual idiots, in my view. Okay, now this, and therefore, to characterize that opinion as being, okay, so you're obviously racist, is such a ridiculous uh, sort of Manichaean view of the world, dividing people right. into all good or all bad, with only extreme opinions being acceptable. It's simply absurd. Right. Um, and so, I think your so, opinion so, is actually, uh, it actually marks, you know, at least in the States, what most people think is they want some level of... Uh, by the way, yes. Also. So, so if I, yeah, if I felt ironically, you know, you, I think there's this Pareto distribution to what you tend to hear, you know, the loudest people, this loudest minority accounts for most of the noise and so on. I mean, is there anybody, by the way, interestingly, if you take this case in the States, I don't, you know, I don't think people... You would probably find, a, you know, 1% of nutters on the far right who thought the behaviour of the um, uh, Minneapolis Police Department was reasonable in that case. Uh, you know, it literally is 1% of, of nutters, I would hope, anyway. Uh, you know, I certainly think the behaviour was absolutely intolerable. Yeah. And uh, the idea, regardless of anything else, of putting the, your knee on the neck of someone who is handcuffed and un un unable to move is so atrocious okay, as to be just absolutely unconscionable. I mean, there's no question about that, okay. Now, yet the behavior of the people who are most angry seems to be assuming that about 40 to 50% of Americans think that was okay. And so you then end up with this conflation where if you go, actually, I don't like people burning shops down. I get the fact that people are completely justifiably angry, but I'd still prefer they didn't burn any shops down. You're somehow viewed as being insufficiently um, a zealot you know, you're insufficiently zealous in your pursuit of social justice to actually believe that the pursuit of social justice need not involve wanton destruction of, in many cases, locally owned shops. Yeah, and, and I think that most people are of, are of that mind that what happened in Minneapolis was atrocious, but at the same time, rioting uh, is, is only going to get somebody like Trump reelected. It's only going to make things horrible. For well, everyone. <laughs> But, uh, but I, I, I think I, I, that this week, including myself, anybody that thinks that is, is lay, laying low, you know, the, loud, the loudest people kind of are, are ruining the day. And by, by the way, I mean, this is from a Brit point of view. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, you know, many of our police aren't even armed. Okay. So I've always found the American police, uh, yeah. not universally, but there's an element of American policing, which is brutalist and um, unpleasant to well, a remarkable the degree. 
the way it was rebranded in the 80s and 90s was proactive, right? So it, there's quotes that are just incredible from like David Deakins in the 90s that are like, you, we can't prevent crime, we, re we react to crime once it happens, you know? And if you heard it today in an American context, it just sounds insane. Because what happened was they started, you know, looking to prevent crime, which means seeking out people. And that's where, you know, racism would, would really come into play because they identify uh, African Americans or Latinos and try to stamp out crime before it happens allegedly, right? So that's what I think has led to a lot of this. Yeah. I mean, one, you know, one of the things is, you know, the previous guy, there was a guy who ended up dead through being arrested for selling cigarettes on the street individually. Right, Eric okay. Yeah. Um, there is no reason why that infraction as a behavior should lead to any physical intervention whatsoever. This is my, you know, but bear in mind, I'm not, you know, I'm not um, um, some sort of left wing nut, but that is not a, that is not a crime which should lead to any kind of physical restraint. Okay. You can ticket the guy, you can tell the guy to move on, uh, you know, but it's not a crime that should ever lead to f physical contact of any shape or form. I mean, it's crazy. Right. Okay. Yeah. But the other thing I will make a point on is that you've had, in some ways, you get this, you get this massive explosion around incidents that happen several times a year, which are sometimes outrageous, sometimes debatable, by the way. Sometimes it's not entirely clear what happened. Sometimes, yeah. as I think is true in this case, it's... Uh, I, I'm still open for other information to become available, but I can't imagine for the life of me what that information might be. You know, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not taking a total stance, but it seems to me highly implausible that there's any defense for that behavior at all, unless there's some weird fact that we just don't know about. Yeah, it, okay. It, it seems like the, the, the sort of, you know, the mainstream kind of center left media in the U.S. has just been like rocked with this wave of cognitive dissonance because we, you know, we were in pandemic and the idea was social distancing and all these things that we're doing and now they've sort of got to come to grips with reversing that or figuring out how that comes into play with with a, a protest movement that is generally supported by you know by the mainstream media uh, there's um, possibly a problem the of the world. Yeah. Uh, there's possibly a problem going on here which i just like to debate and it may be wrong but you probably know those models of riot which is you have people are not ones twos threes fours yeah so there's a person who'll basically right, yeah. trash a window under any circumstances then there are people who are fives who will only start breaking windows when five other people are doing it Okay. Yeah. Now the fact that nobody I would have thought over 40 is going to be keen to take place in a mass demonstration. Okay. Is meaning that the demonstrations are disproportionately young and therefore full of noughts, twos and ones, rather than if you had a demonstration under normal conditions without COVID face mask distancing. Okay. Uh, you ha you would have a less uh, zealous, um, probably older, um, uh, composition. Well, of it the seems like it wouldn't happen. It seems like those things are, are in opposition to each other, right? Like, I don't know how a protest, an in-person protest, would work with distancing. It would just be even just a tame one. It seems like it could it couldn't play out. Um, so, so, the, yeah. but I mean, the one thing I would make from a Brit point of view, I mean, which is I'm criticizing the American left here, is you've had this position. You you have these amazing flashpoints around things which. Um, single incidents which rightly, for the most part, but sometimes wrongly, scandalize you, okay? Right. Um, uh, the, on the other hand, you've had this long-term thing where the rate of incarceration in the United States, regardless of race, is absurdly high by comparison with any other country, okay? So other than China, I think you have the highest rate of incarceration in terms of your population going. Then if you look at the figures by ethnicity, they become worse still because they're grossly yeah. disproportionate. And then you look at the figures by reason for the incarceration, and it's often fairly trivial, say, drug-related offense. Yes. Okay. And you've had quite a chunk of democratic um, uh, governments, okay, in the last 20 or 30 years, who have done nothing about that. Right. You know, right. now... I, you know, I mean, I, I don't understand. No, my point being, this brings us back to my first point. At the very least, experiment, guys, okay? I mean, this, this is what I said at the beginning, which is, you, you know, is it possible that the incarceration is causing more problems than it solves? And there Absolutely. must be, you know, if you can break away from this kind of industrial penitential complex there must be other things you can do which reduce recidivism and solve the problem apart from the else else in a less barbaric form okay yeah. and it's pretty it's 
pretty heavy, right? I mean, I would, to be honest, okay, and I hate to say this, okay, but if I, as a middle class Brit, if I were found guilty of some white collar crime, okay, I, I'll be absolutely honest, it, it would be a significant inconvenience, but I, you know, a prison spell in a kind of British open prison, which is probably what I'd get, would be um, an annoyance, but it wouldn't be the most terrifying thing that had happened to me in my life. It's worth remembering if you watch Narcos, okay, the one thing the drug kingpins were terrified of, okay, more than even death, was extradition to a US prison, okay? Right, because they own the prisons. Because, yeah. I mean, they kind of own the prisons, right? So, right. right. Um, well, you know, um, I think to some extent, all Americans have to contend with proactive policing and the fact, uh, and, and, and really draconian drug offense laws and all, all these things. But then, you know, people in poor communities who tend to skew black or Latino are, are going to have a way harder go of it once they end up in that sort of trouble. But, you know, if you talk to most Americans, uh, even suburban white people, you know, so many of us have run afoul of minor laws uh, and yeah. really had to deal with this stuff way more than, than when I meet Europeans or, or Australians or anybody else. Uh, so, that there, you know, there are like really tangible policies that I think a lot of people want to change. It's just hard to, it's hard to make it happen because we have lots of these little, we have, you know, 50 closed experiments happening at all times. Uh, well, so I mean... I, I know this is a weird one. Okay, now, first of all, I want to be really clear that I'm, for the, 80% of me is a massive Americana file, okay? I love going there. I love the people. I love the place, the scenery, the countryside. I love everything about it, you know? I mean, you know, if I didn't live here, somewhere like New Mexico would be where I'd go to, you know, like a shot, or, you know, the American West. I'd be there like a shot. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's absolutely no animus here. But you do, one weird thing, is you do have Canada as a control cell, okay? And maybe just occasionally, just by the law of averages, the Canadians have happened to stumble on something that works that you haven't, okay? And yet in things like healthcare or in things like mass transit uh, or in things like um, incarceration, you are preternaturally unwilling to take lessons from anywhere else. Now, Brits, yeah. Brits are deeply arrogant and exceptionalist people, okay? Brit you know, British exceptionalism is not is certainly a thing, okay? We'll nick shit from anywhere. I'm, I'm serious, yeah. okay? Yeah. Food, you know, curry, curry, anything, okay? Yeah. You know, we'll, basically, if someone's got an interesting idea out there, we'll nick it, okay? You know, there's no particular... Um, uh, idea of yes but uh, but unfortunately the idea of um, the cut and cover uh, underground station was pioneered in Germany so it's unacceptable for us to adopt it and there is a weird American thing which is you generally believe I mean it patently in some spheres where you are ahead of the curve in tech for example your exceptionalism is probably pretty well justified you know but the likelihood that you can be absolutely world leading in every single industry, in every single category, in every single area of government simultaneously just seems to be just statistically yeah. implausible. We're a little, a little quixotic like that sometimes. Well, one thing that I find super interesting, especially with like my own ancestors, is that we're the Scotch Irish, which were essentially the borderers, you know, between Scotland and Ireland. They were just killing each other for years. And then your mm. people said, you know, go to Ireland, you're going to be a bulwark against the Catholics. And then the, the Irish Protestants said, get the hell out of here, go to America, we don't want you here. And then those became the first people to identify as Americans, basically. They're the ones holding yep. the double barrel shotgun saying, get off my land. So although, you know, whether or not you descend from those people, it doesn't matter. That's kind of like the foundation, it seems like, of the U.S. It's like, we're, we're, and it's we're, interesting, we're, it's we're interesting too. There's a great, there's a great book I can recommend called Albion Seed, which yeah, is one of a series. Of, from, okay? Yeah, it's, 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 you're called Englander, but you're actually um, essentially a mixture of Scots Irish and Catholic Irish. Are you or? Well, Englander is actually the, my Jewish side, so that's uh, oh. Ukrainian. We're Brent Randall. It's a weirdly Jewish name. Yeah. Oh, how interesting! So, but yeah. the, the Albion Seed is interesting in the sense that what it suggests is that cultural things. And it might be weirdly possible that the South is doing a better job than the North of race relations, which I, is an I've interesting thing. I've always thought that. I've always thought that because I have half of my family is in, is in Southern Virginia. And when I, you know, when I go down there as a kid to visit cousins, they, you know, they have way more black friends. It just seemed in, in weird ways more integrated. Uh, I haven't spent much time in Atlanta, but from everybody, everybody I talk to, it's 
a way more integrated city than the New Yorks or the DCs of the world. So I, yeah, I've always found that that kind of interesting. And uh, something I noticed, which is that. You know, I always joke, uh, this is a slightly unkind joke, but I always joke that the uh, the United States consists of red states, which are full of nice people pretending to be nasty, and the blue states are nasty people pretending to be nice, which is totally unfair and a ridiculous generalization. But there's a yeah, tiny, yeah. there's a tiny notch of it, which is that actually I'd rather, I'd rather I broke down in Texas than in Massachusetts in terms of someone stopping to help me, which has always yeah. sort of puzzled me as a kind of, uh, you know, an, an anomaly. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's true, and you know I think there's probably like fear and uh, stereotypes on both sides. I think everybody in the north thinks that it's going to be like deliverance, and everybody in the yeah. south thinks it's going to be like uh, whatever a uh, you know urban horror movie of the of the, the year it is out. <laughs> so I think that there's a lot of that happening. Yeah, I think it is, I mean it is it is interesting. I think in that it's worth remembering. Okay, that there are often trade offs. Uh, in that, you know, I come from a rural back. We're talking about this kind of advertising thing. Now, I come from a sort of rural, small rural town and village background, mm -hmm. and my argument would be it would be slower for outsiders of a different or the same ethnic group, actually, regardless of ethnicity. But you know, ethnicity might accentuate it. It would be slower for them to become accepted. But once accepted, after you've kind of paid your commitment devices to the community, actually the level of um, acceptance and inclusion would actually be higher. Yeah, that's interesting. So I mean, Wales is a bit weird. I grew up in Wales, which is a bit weird like that because it's, um, uh, I mean, both it has a strong culture, but the ethnicity of the Welsh is, is quite blurry, to be honest. Well, um, yeah, and I think like the the thing that I think doesn't often compute for for Americans is the idea of of class without it having any sort of like racial or national component to it. So you know, I, I think that that's one thing when when Americans are thinking about the UK, where they where we're just like we don't really understand how that stuff sticks for so long and what what it, what it's like. If that makes sense. And it's sort of, I mean, in a sort of way, it's an interesting. Um, uh, it, it, I mean. You know, without defending anything, it was an interesting property in things like colonialism, because a king of Tonga was still a king. Okay, right. so in, if you had a seating plan in 1905, okay, for some banquet, okay, didn't matter where you were king of, okay, you sat at the top of the table, and so. Um, there was an element where, it, you know, now uh, th th that, that is a crap, in a sense, it's a crap defense of what was in most respects a pretty awful phenomenon, but it was different uh, in the sense that your status depended on your status within your particular entity. Uh, and so that trumped any kind of ethnic consideration. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, and it works just to be respectful of your time because you're, you're not the best of time, so I want to protect you from yourself <laughs> in the right way. Although I, if I was being selfish, I would, I would go for another two hours. Right? Um, but to, as long as we're on hot button issues, I'd love to know like, what, if any, underappreciated opportunities for irrational problem solving have you observed or are you observing in the context of pandemic? Yeah, the first thing, the very, very simple thing, which I think we ought to just say and say it loud and out there, okay? First of all, I think marketing and advertising uh, needs to pivot significantly. If you're a creative agency or a media agency to that extent, but certainly if you're a creative agency, we're still behaving as though we were paid on commission and we haven't been paid on commission since the late 80s, early 90s. Therefore, we've got to start working on problems that are brought to us not only by the marketing director and not only those problems that have a large media budget attached to the proposed solution. We've got to start working on wider psychological solutions in the business space, even if the budget comes from a completely different source. Even if the business we work with doesn't have a marketing function at all, in that case, we're even more necessary than ever because they probably haven't got anybody who thinks about problems in this way. You know, Unilever has. Let's be absolutely honest about it, okay? Unilever isn't short of marketing talent, but I certainly hope not, okay? And um, yet, you know, so I, I notice this still, is if we say we've got some work from the Thames Valley Police, or I've got to give a talk to the Kent Police, 
Okay. Now, here's an area where behavioral science, and by the way, worldwide, if I may say so, could be deployed really, really usefully. Okay. And the new business people don't have the same level of excitement as if I said, we've got some, a new project from Golden Wonder Crisps. I mean, you know, um, Pringles, okay, to give an American flavor to it. And that's because they're still looking at the world as though the size of the media budget determines the value of our contribution. And my argument is that, that isn't true at all. Okay, first of all, you know, I fully accept the fact that the Thames Valley Police will never have as big a media budget as Pringles. Okay, problems, they don't need one, they can arrest people, right? You don't need, you don't need a huge, okay, you don't need a huge persuasive media budget if you can actually arrest people. But also, that doesn't mean there isn't a huge application for marketing-led, customer-led, or citizen-led thinking in this space. And the second thing is, don't get worried about the whole science of behavioral science. You know, the p-values. My point is that the difference between academia and science and business is really interesting. Science is what you use when there's a single right answer, and where you have all the data necessary in order to prove that your single right answer is correct. Now, in that area, okay, logistics in business might be like a science, okay? You could actually use mathematical modeling to basically go, this is the right thing. Business and capitalism and, um, and what you might call markets as market testing through variation and selection, which is the kind of Darwinist bit of business. That's different because you don't have a single right answer. In fact, the opposite of a good idea can be another good idea. Uh, whether something's good or bad entirely depends on the language you use to describe it. So it isn't even safe to assume that the data you have uh, remotely reflects or predicts how people will respond. Okay, how would people respond to Nespresso if it were sold in jars? They'd look at the jar and go, Jesus, it's 35 pounds. It's, it's eight times more expensive than Maxwell House. There's no way I'm buying that. If you put it in a pod, they go, oh, it's a lot cheaper than Starbucks. Okay, right? So yeah. the idea that you can use objective data to arrive at conclusions in our space is, is, is wrong. Now, the, good, the bad news from that is you're never going to sit there smugly and go, the answer is 3.7, and there is no other answer that is better than 3.7. So that is how we should proceed. You don't have the level of certainty you enjoy, nor should you seek it, okay? The level of certainty you enjoy in physics. The good news is that it, once you acknowledge this blurriness, it massively expands your potential solution space. Yeah. So the number of ways you can solve a problem, um, as envisaged by an economist, might be two, right? You make the product better or you reduce the price, okay? Or you, you know, you employ superior supply chain management, okay? That's what a kind of McKinseyite would say, right? In marketing world, the way you can improve that product could be telling a new story about it, advertising the product while featuring an interesting animatronic duck. It could be putting the price up, but charging for it differently, okay? It could be, actually, if we charge for this weekly rather than monthly, people will view it, the price in a completely different way. There are literally a hundred solutions to a problem that are possible in the psychological space to every one or two that are made possible in the space of economics. And the trade-off is between the degree of certainty you want and the extent to which you wish to defend your decision versus quality and range of, of solutions and decisions. Right. Right. And so the attempt to make this into a science is essentially erroneous. I think business, we can go in the seam here, it's stochastic, okay? Right. Quite a lot of successful businesses arose through sheer bloody accident. Someone didn't really know what they were doing and happened to do something. I mean, I'll give you an example just from my local area. Um, uh, you know, somebody bought a restaurant um, and uh, every single restaurant that had opened uh, in that location had failed. And I thought, oh, God, the guy from the kebab shops bought this bloody building. Oh, God, poor guy. And I was there utterly despairing. It turns out if you run a really good Turkish restaurant, okay, um, the things that put you off going to a French restaurant don't apply. I don't know about you. I'm a huge ethnic food fan, right? And are you an ethnic food fan? I'd be interested to know. Yeah. Yeah, especially uh, especially now. I mean, I, I'm now in Northern Virginia, D.C. area where we have a really good and 
as as this. Oh, but you've also you've also got, you've also got that pit barbecue scene. Have you have you been to Pierce's Pit? That's in no, Southern Virginia. Okay, but no, yeah. that pit barbecue scene is fantastic. But you yeah. also presumably prosper from all Tyler Cowan's restaurant recommendations on Marshall exactly. Revolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're the same stuff. yeah. But there's an interesting thing about ethnic restaurants. Yeah. There's a great thing about ethnic restaurants, which is, I'll be actually honest with you, okay, nobody ever uses the sentence, I'd kill for some rigatoni right now, okay? Italian food, French food, it's great but you never conceive the insane lustful desire for it that you do for ethnic food. And also I think it's, it's fragile being back to to live, to live speak. It's, it's fragile in that you go, you have to go somewhere to, to get the full experience, you know, but Chinese food to go and food to go. Yeah, it's, basically it's still great. It's still great. Yeah. So, so no, I think there's something really interesting. Now the example would be, I'll, I'll give you a lovely example of this. Okay. What the business world tends to do and the government world, is they tend to seek out non-psychological explanations so they can keep everything within their reductionist map of the world. Okay, so here's a lovely question to end on, okay, which I've just borrowed from, if you like, Robert H. Frank, who's one of my heroes. Uh, by the way, we've talked a bit about politics here. I also ought to say that since being interested in behavioral science, A, I can get on with people who are behavioral scientists from a complete range of the social spectrum with no animus whatsoever. Okay. I occasionally might say myself going, yeah, if you look at it from your angle, that looks good. But if you look at it from this guy's angle, it's going to look a bit shit. And I occasionally have to be the voice of the sheep farmer within the agency, you know, the voice of kind of middle America to, to you know, middle England uh, in a sense. Okay. Which is a rare um, but, <laughs> but the first thing is I can have discussions with people who are literally, you know, Marxists or, you know, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hang out with any Nazis or fascists, but I can take an extraordinary range of political discussion when framed in a behavioral lens. It's the first thing. The second thing is I will also repeatedly revise my own opinions on things so that if you want to describe my politics, they're kind of the only reason I'm seen as being right of center is I have some right of center opinions. It's not a, it's not a package deal here. Right. Okay. Right, right. David Brooks would be, if you wanted an American person who I'd aspire to be, if I were a Yank, you know, that's the kind of territory I think. And by the way, it tends to be paywalls. That's the other problem. Intelligent conservatism, because conservatives pay for the things they use. Okay. Intelligent conservative commentary tends to be disproportionately paywalled. So you've got a load of young people whose vision, whose vision of politics is like a whole gamut of sane left of center opinion, which gets a bit nutty at the fringes. Then you have this yawning gap and then you kind of have Breitbart. I read right. Breitbart, right. I'll read anything, okay? But it's, that's not a representative view of a political spectrum, by any means. Right, and the, the, the sort of uh, the low-end entry is, is pretty pretty crazy and polarized, and that's where you <laughs> get the trumps of the world. Yeah, there is sort of a country club dynamic to getting up to the, the family of conservatives. So the thing is, once you start talking about psychology instead of talking about economics, it makes everything much less Manichaean and much less binary. And you go, yeah, you know, to be honest, right wing people wouldn't mind wealth redistribution. What they don't like about wealth redistribution is that it destroys incentive structures. Now, you can still redistribute wealth through, say, a universal basic income. And you find weirdly that right wing people are kind of cool with that idea because it still pays you to make an effort. And there's still a reward for doing something clever or entrepreneurial. It just happens that, you know, the, the relative rewards are preserved, but the relative extremity of the rewards is dampened. The weirdest thing is it just happened in the States. And I, I mean, I'm not sure how other people thought of it, but I thought there was kind of this like weird deer in headlights moment with conservatives because they were like, do we like this? Do we not like this? <laughs> What's happening yeah, no, no. here? Yeah. And so, so, you know, one of the reasons I'm, you know, I'm not, um, uh, but the, the other thing is that this attempt to describe everything in economic terms is an attempt to define the problem in your own terms so that you own the solution. So here's a really great question. Robert Frank, who, again, left to center guy, I guess, um, uh, uh, though perfectly sane, um, uh, his economic thought experiments to his students are wonderful, wonderful things. If you buy any of his books, The Economic Naturalist, for example, uh, you'll be able to read them. And here's my version of his, okay? And it's a slightly different experiment. So why is it you get far more fish restaurants by the sea? Now, if I give that question to a load of people 
To be honest, just a random selection of people, but also if I give it to a bunch of people working for McKinsey or working in business or working in in, uh, um, uh, in finance or anything like that, immediately they're going to start bur- at Harvard Business School. Okay, they're going to start burbling on about supply, uh, you know, low cost, low distribution cost, blah 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 blah. Okay, now I'm not sure that those are the principal explanations at all. They could simply be a post rationalization. I'm not sure that fish wouldn't be cheap. <coughs> <coughs> Fresh fish might be cheaper at a large inland market in London than it is next to the coast. Secondly, if it were all about distribution, you'd expect to find lots of fish restaurants five miles inland as well, and you don't. Okay. My contention is that it's probably mostly explained by psychological factors, which is that fish taste better next to the sea, combined with a social perceptual factor, which is generally... Out of any group of six people, there's always one person who doesn't feel like eating fish. So you end up having pizza instead. But when you're by the sea, there seems to be a particularly good reason to eat fish or fish just the, the smell of the, tea, of the sea makes fish taste better. Rosé wine tastes better by the sea. Okay. You know, Perno tastes better in France. There are loads of these biases going on. Okay, in perceptual terms, not a bias. Yeah, it seems um, like they take on a life of their own. So eventually, you you just have fish because that's what you do when you're. And that's that's what, what you do. When, you know, just as you eat ice cream when you're by the sea, or we do, or you knock your handkerchief and put it on your head, which right. you wouldn't. Uh, sorry, that that probably doesn't translate at all. Um, but but certain things then take on a life of their own. Right. But my point is that everybody leaps to the non-psychological explanation first. So there's literally a case in point where they've modelled it at the London School of Economics. How much will you need to do to encourage people to have smart meters? And the conclusion they come to is you have to pay people £100 to have a smart meter. And my reaction to that is, fuck off. Okay, if you genuinely can't find a more ingenious way of selling smart meters than bribing people to have one, which in turn, by the way, will make people think of the smart meter as something they grudgingly accept rather than something they actively want, then your idea is bollocks. Okay, there are loads of ways. If you built in a tiny bit of health of, of security to the smart meter, like leak detection and, and smoke detection, okay, right. I argued with them, don't sell this thing as an environmental thing because people will resent it. What you do is you say, put it next to your door, where every time you leave the house, take a look at your smart meter and you'll be able to tell if you've left anything switched on. Or or maybe the amount of of estimated money you've saved. You know, oh, exactly. You could even like you could that. even talk about that. That you know, or, or you could talk about the fact that don't talk about the fact that you become super, superbly eco conscious and walk around the house turning on things. Just say you never leave things switched on, because yeah. you're walking through the bloody hallway. This is where mine sits. Okay, when it's red, I want to know why. And occasionally, it's because my bloody daughter's turned on this electric heater in the kitchen, which I wasn't even aware of. And then having left the kitchen, she's left it switched on. So I immediately go into the kitchen and turn the bastard off. That has saved me um, several pounds a month of energy consumption, which was otherwise utterly pointless. Right. So then right. No, just tell a different story. Don't change, you know, you could change the product. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. You know, you could build it into... Um, uh, you know, could you build it into people's Alexas or nests, uh, you know, so that actually, you know, Alexa will notify you when you're going into the red zone or when you leave the house, when you open the door, Alexa will say you're current, you be careful you haven't left something switched on. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what I was getting at the last question. Is, is there anything like that you've seen with face masks or social distancing beyond just fear, beyond just making people scared to the point where they're just saying that they're just going to rebel against it eventually? I'm just wondering. Uh, the face you- mask, the, the, yeah. the American reaction to the face mask thing is slightly weird. I don't fully understand it, actually. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a long story. <laughs> what, what, what's it about exactly? Because it's not a major construct. I mean, you people have a very funny idea of liberty, don't you? Because... You, so know, you, you, accept the, this, yeah. you accept the incarceration of huge proportions of your population. That doesn't conflict with your idea of liberty. But when we put a small tax on tea, you went batshit insane. Yeah. I mean, you, you really do need to get your act together on deciding what meaningful liberty is. Because yeah. wearing You're a face wrong. mask... <laughs> Okay, wearing a face mask for my own benefit doesn't strike me as an extraordinary intrusion on my liberty. Well, I wasn't thinking about it so much from just an American context, but the more, you know, 
the sort of behavior change across the world that we're going to need to see. I'm wondering if there's any, if there's any real drought in there, if there's any slight reframes that would make it more palatable. Well, one of the things is that, um, one, you can make them, uh, you know, desirable uh, um, or even fashionable. Okay? Why not? Why, you know? Secondly, of course, there's a major reframing at work, which is, I have to confess, that when I first came across people wearing face masks, it was mostly Japanese or Chinese tourists in London. Right. And my interpretation of the gesture was completely wrong. I thought they were wearing them because they thought we were unclean. You know, I, I did in, unconsciously kind of go, oh, I see, they're basically thinking the fil filthy guaylo are, you know, letting off yeah. unclean germs, and they want to protect themselves from the vile stench, stench of, uh, uh, of, uh, 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 of the indigenous population. Yeah, yeah. And it was only much later that I realised they're done actually as a pro-social gesture because you've got a cold and you don't want to infect anybody else. Right, right. And I suddenly realized there are probably 10% of employees at Ogilvy who over the previous 20 years, I only wish had worn bloody face masks. I hate people coming in when they got a cold. I, right. I, I'm a bit Howard Hughes, you know, I and really, the, really hate germy you know. people, you know, yeah. and, you um, <laughs> and, and so it's, um, uh, it is, it is a really interesting, um, uh, approach here which is that you, the first thing you can do is you can actually say that this is actually a generous and thoughtful thing to do. It's not a selfish thing to do. And the main value of the masks probably are the fact that it prevents significantly large globules of um, sputum um, aerosolizing um, and therefore infecting a large number of other people. That may right. be a bigger benefit than the benefit to the wearer. Um, yeah. but, I, but equally, I mean, I, I don't fully understand the... Um, uh, reluctance. The, the, only thing I w the other thing I would say is that it is a sign um, that you take this thing vaguely seriously. And so if I'm walking down the street and I'm approached by three people with masks, I don't really have to worry about whether they're going to self-distance. Whereas if I'm, if I'm approached by six people without masks, I'm going to give them a bit of an extra wide berth to make sure they don't step into my um, uh, exclusion zone, as it were. Yeah, and I think that that's been turned into a perverse way in the U.S. of, of, of sort of a political signaling device as opposed to a health signaling device. Yeah. So I think that's that's part of the problem. Um, yeah, that, that's not good. Um, so no, I mean, that, that's an interesting one, which is, I mean, it's interesting that Trump refuses to wear one, I think, or he has worn one under certain circumstances, isn't he? Yeah, but not much. You don't see him with one one on very often it, or nor nor with pens right so so i mean so that weird signaling device is very unfortunate because i think signaling devices um i mean you could argue it's a costly signal that you are taking a risk by doing this um well yeah one way or the other it's, it's a costly signal right <laughs> Yeah, we. To be honest, I I would not in in the UK. I would infer absolutely nothing about someone's political allegiance by their decision to wear a mask, and it seems one of the most unfortunate things is the way in which things which don't need to become polarized along political lines. Um, right, that's what we're we're dealing with a lot a lot now. So, <laughs> yeah, hopefully you know, uh, we'll get through it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a whole concatenation of things that I think are at work here. I mean, it's uh, it's kind of interesting, uh, but um, what what does strike me as weird is that the urge to signal your commitment to a cause extends to doing things which you must know at a conscious level are increasing Trump's ch chances of being reelected. Okay. Yeah. 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 And people, and pe pe people, people must know this. Okay. Yeah. Now, you know, either you want to actually replace, you know, um, uh, democracy with some sort of mob rule, which is possible for ten percent of people, um, and you might argue maybe it's that ten percent who are most behind. I mean, there was something in the UK which happened similarly, which is worth a hundred thousand conservative votes, which is people sprayed the word "fuck" on a war memorial. Okay. Now, okay. Now, if I sat down with Jonathan Haidt and said, "Okay, I really want, I really want to annoy Middle America or Middle England." Then yeah. spray painting fuck on a war memorial is, I'm pretty sure it was a second world war memorial as well. It was, I mean, it was, you know, 
Jeez. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that really is kind of, you know, off the charts in terms of, uh, and so what you're doing is you're actually, um, so this is a huge problem, which I think, and, and journalists are guilty of this because journalists cover in politics the things that are most polarized. Quite a lot of politics in Britain, at least, still involves people from all sides of the political spectrum getting together and working out how to improve something. And that is probably the majority of the work that goes on in Parliament. And yet, if you read journalistic political coverage, you only read about the things where people are actually divided. And it has an appalling effect on people's perception of what politics is. Yeah, yeah, and it seems to be accentuated by the algorithm and so on, right? That's, that's the, the thing we're dealing with now across the globe, I guess. I think journalists are guilty themselves, though. I think yeah. journalists, uh, I think every journalist wants to imagine themselves as Woodward and Bernstein, and they're too anti, they're too anti establishment, by the way. Uh, in some senses, in that, you know, ev when every single thing that the ruling government does is sneered at, then the MSM and fake media claims start to become a bit plausible. Yeah, yeah. And to, to kind of close this out, because we're, we're, I want to respect your time. Um, what, what do you, th where, where, where do you think the agency plays into this? You know, what, what, what are you optimistic about in, in what we can do as, as marketers, <laughs> if anything? make things better um, well I think I, I think there is an opportunity um, and possibly a technologically enhanced opportunity to make um, because if you think about it since this crisis started nearly all business questions are ultimately behavioral questions you know I mean you know there are some aspects which are scientific questions or medical questions but the question you're asking as an airline is not you know what do we expect fuel prices to do it's suddenly how can we get people back on planes and so the opportunity for marketing and the wider I would prefer marketing sat on a kind of platform of uh, psychology but the, the the opportunity for marketers to step up to the plate a bit more uh, in the next six months to a year strikes me as fairly high. I mean, there are huge questions at stake, like how do business people talk to other business people? You know, the standard mode was the conference, the Congress, the trade fair that, you know, those ain't going to be happening at scale for a year, really. They may, they may never be as big ever again. Right. So the question of how do we actually create and promulgate business ideas and thinking uh, without that traditional mode available. Now, the good news is um, Nudge Stock, which is on the 12th of June, we've taken it virtual. It used to get five, 600 people down by the Kent coast. We've taken it virtual. We've taken it global. Uh, we've just hit 17,000 registrants. And it starts in Sydney and ends in Hawaii, I think. Okay. Now, so at one level, this is fantastic because one of the problems with conferences was that often the most valuable audience for your message, as we know as advertisers, isn't the core target audience, it's the hinterland. And one of the problems with conferences is that marketing people went to marketing conferences, compliance people went to compliance conferences, finance people went to conferences on tax, okay? And actually, one of the great things is that the overspill through making these things digital and vastly less expensive may mean that businesses become less siloed in their thinking. So, you know, I hope sincerely, you know, we've just had a huge heap of registrants from Nudstock for a very large bank. And not all those people are marketers at the bank. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So, I, I mean, I, to be honest, I, I regard my job really as being a kind of not very good, but tolerably successful marketing impresario which is all you've got to do is continually spending your time reminding people that in every business problem and opportunity, there's a psychological component to be explored, which the natural tendency of business is to pretend away. Right. Right. Until you're in this sort of rational. Yeah. Insanity. So that makes sense. So, just a quick so plug. Nudgestock.co.uk. Yeah. Nudgestock.co.uk. Yeah, nudge we'll get that linked up. Roy, thank you so much for your time. Thanks ever so much. It's been a huge pleasure. Anytime. Likewise. Yeah, it's good. All the best. Bye-bye.